Okay, that's it. Chris, it's all oh. yours. Thank you, Gerald. And so with that, I will also add that, you know, uh, feedback is definitely appreciated, uh, especially for those of us who speak to a lot of groups. Um, I speak to a lot of groups, but I don't often get to speak um, to groups like yours, to a group of students. So feedback is always greatly appreciated. Um, well, as Gerald said, I'm Chris Christian. Um, I'm with the California Strawberry Commission. And my background um, is uh, maybe a little different than some of your other speakers. Uh, I'm not from California. I'm from Western Pennsylvania originally. Um, I grew up on a small family farm um, just north of Pittsburgh and uh, found my way uh, to agriculture uh, really kind of, you know, inadvertently as a, as a, a science major. Um, I went to Penn State University and was not interested at all in agriculture and uh, went into microbiology, um, but by happenstance, I took a couple of food science electives in my senior year. And that got me very interested in food and agriculture. And I eventually made my way back to Penn State and uh, got a master's degree in food science there and uh, was working at the time also on some post-harvest research projects with the mushroom growers um, and the wine grape growers in the state. And uh, from there, I made my way to the fresh produce industry, um, in the salad industry, started out working in central Pennsylvania at a processing plant, made my way to California um, into R&D for Fresh Express. Um, you may recognize that name, salad company. And um, from R&D, I made my way into business management at Fresh Express. And from there, I made my way to the California strawberry industry um, in marketing um, and PR. And so it's, it's really a great honor um, to be here with you. Um, and I wanted to just start by giving you a little bit of background on who's the California Strawberry Commission. Um, a lot of you might not be familiar with a commission or what is the California Strawberry Commission. So the commission is created by state law um, to represent all of the growers, shippers, and processors of strawberries here in California. Um, we are a mandatory program, um, and so we are funded by assessment. Um, so every, every grower, shipper, and processor pays an assessment on every tray or flat of strawberries that they either produce or handle, send into the marketplace. That's how our programs are funded. Um, in addition to some grant funding we receive from USDA um, and um, other um, public funding entities. What does the commission do? Um, so our mission, to unify the California strawberry industry to ensure successful farming operations while inspiring consumers and policymakers to love and sustain California strawberries. To love and sustain. Um, so that's maybe a bit different than other missions, but that is our mission. Um, and when we talk about sustaining California strawberry farmers, in 2013, the commission partnered with Cal Poly to create the Strawberry Center. And with the purpose of the Strawberry Center uh, is to do the important work, practical applied research, to sustain our farmers and help develop future innovations for our industry. And also to train all of you um, to be future leaders in our industry, in strawberries and in California agriculture. So that is the purpose of the commission. And again, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, uh, well, Dr. Holmes invited me to speak about marketing strawberries. And uh, so some of the things we're going to talk about, though, um, are going to be about the, the North American market and the production, um, trade, and consumption trends within North America. And this is really important to us, all of us as marketers in the California strawberry industry. Um, we need to be informed by market and consumer information um, in order to increase consumption, if that's our goal, um, and also expand um, and the consumer's connection to our beautiful California strawberries. So while you'll be seeing a lot of data in this talk, um, I hope to be able to share some insights and some context, um, and also point to some opportunities that all of us in the industry who are doing marketing are using to ensure the future of California strawberries. So again, uh, we're gonna talk about an overview of North America, some import export trends, um, production trends and challenges, market and consumption, and then try to close a little discussion and more of a broader discussion about what are the purchase drivers for consumers today. 
Um, I am going to start with just an overview of North America and talk about each one of these countries in North America because our markets, our production, our consumption are integrally, integrally combined. Um, and so in each case, I'm going to give you a little overview of each country, um, its production, um, its imports, its exports, um, its total consumption, um, and its per capita pounds, and whether or not that country is a net importer or a net exporter. Uh, in the case of the U.S., we are the top um, producing country in North America. Most of that production um, comes from right here in California, most of U.S. production. Um, our consumption exceeds our production as a country, so we have to import to meet that consumption and that demand. And um, we only export a small um, portion of the strawberries we produce from the United States. So that makes us a net Ex, a net importer, or excuse me, yes, a net importer. When you see a negative balance here, that means you're a net importer. Make sense? Okay. Uh, Mexico, also an important producing country, um, an important country um, for exporting um, strawberries. Um, we are their largest trading partner in terms of strawberries but also um, important um, export market for us here in California. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we move on through. And um, they are a net exporter. You can see the positive trade balance um, for Mexico. Canada has a very small local production. Um, Canadians have to import most of the foods that they eat. Um, strawberries are no exception. So the majority of, what comes, majority of what Canadians consume is imported. Um, and then they are also, again, a net importer, negative balance on exports. Now, um, consumption. Consumption is very similar. Um, you can see that consumption, these are overall consumption trends um, for both fresh and frozen strawberries combined for per capita, um, have been declining over the past five years in Canada and Mexico and have been increasing in the U.S., particularly over the last three years. This chart represents production in North America and that annual production cycle that we see um, as we go throughout the year. And I say production on this chart, you'll see the same chart a little later talking about supply. Um, so all of the primary producing regions in North America are listed here, California, Florida, Mexico. Canada is not on this chart as a producer because their volume is very, very, very small that they produce. Um, but in the early part of the season, um, supply and production is really dominated by uh, Florida and Mexico. Um, if we look at this three-year average, the most current three-year average, we can see that if you stack these charts, we're talking about, on average, somewhere around 6 million trays per week um, of production. That production is trying to satisfy that market demand. And we have market demand all year round um, here in North America. And uh, California kicks in, and for this period, um, usually from April all the way into the fall, California is the dominant supplier. Now, it's a real side note, what's happening this year um, with all these, all the rains, the flooding, the challenges that we've had this year. The production throughout California has been delayed. Um, some acres have been lost um, and won't be coming back. Um, so whereas our production, we're in this week right now, we should be somewhere between, we should be up to around 6 million trays right now, um, 6 million or more right about now. I'm going to guess this week we're going to be somewhere four and a half to five million trays, maybe higher. Um, but finally, finally, over the last two weeks, production has started to pick up because the rains have stopped, spring has come, and we are moving towards this normal production curve, and we hope to be up to these levels here as we get into May. But what we will see this year is we'll see this entire curve shifting to the right because of the delays. So I'll talk a little bit about the U.S. first. For each one of the countries, I'm going to show you some data. I told you there's going to be a lot of data here. Um, but uh, the point is really just to illustrate some of the, the trading patterns and some of the dynamics that we have to consider 
um, wherever we are producing and marketing strawberries um, in whatever part of North America. So on these charts, uh, we'll see here, oops, get the pointer, um, you know, U.S. total consumption. Our total consumption is higher than our domestic production. That's what these tr this line is. And these lines represent a five-year trend um, for each one of these parameters. And you can see to meet our consumption needs, our export demand has increased. So we have a need to export to, excuse me, import more strawberries on an annual basis. Um, and we export a very small portion of the strawberries that we produce in the United States. Most of our strawberry exports um, are going, staying within North America. They're going to Canada and Mexico. Um, California strawberries um, make up the majority of those exports. Um, we do ship California strawberries to over 30 countries worldwide. Um, those that are going distances, let's say to Europe or Asia, they're going by air freight. They're going out of Los Angeles or San Francisco to go overseas. Uh, but the reason that Mexico and Canada are so important um, is because it's easy transportation. It's ground transportation. We have trade agreements in place that have always made access within North America and North American markets um, fairly simple and logistically simple for marketers and shippers. Just to give some numbers, um, you know, we export about 86% by volume um, to Canada and Mexico, um, and 75% of our total export value um, goes to Canada and Mexico. So that really illustrates the um, importance of these markets. And even though overall exports from California are small, um, as a proportion of our total production in the state, we only export about 17% on average. Um, but again, these markets um, are important, um, and this illustrates some of the trends um, in terms of export volume over the years and the value. And they're also important because you remember that peak, that big high part of that curve, that peak season curve? That is when the U.S. market gets fairly saturated with strawberries, and it's important that we be able to send those strawberries somewhere else during that time frame. Um, and if we're sending them to Canada or Mexico, that helps relieve pressure on the U.S. market and on our farmers here in the U.S. And I mentioned that um, you know we are we are basically in that in that importer, so we import more than we export to meet our domestic supply demands. Um, and if we look at total imports, um, fresh and frozen, Mexico is our primary trading partner there. If we look at five years ago, this other, uh, which is made up of all these countries here, um, this other was probably only about 10% of our imports. Um, but over the years, um, we've received imports from different countries from around the world. Um, most of these are very, very small amounts, um, all adding up to almost a quarter of our annual import volume today. Now I'm gonna shift and talk a bit about California because we are the dominant. We are the most dominant supplier here in North America. So almost two billion fresh pounds last year, um, almost half a million pounds frozen last year. Uh, we have a fresh crop value of over of 2.7 billion and we represent 87% of U.S. fresh strawberry production. Right now we're producing on just over 40,000 acres in the state. And you can see up here our average yield, our average yields have increased over the years. And we have one of the most highly productive um, systems for growing strawberries and open field production in the world here in California. And the other thing we have that's unique and that most areas of the world don't have is we have the Central Coast. We have the ideal climate for growing strawberries here along the central coast with the, the cool weather, um, the moderating effect of the coastal breezes and the fog, um, and the warming throughout the day. And that allows us to grow strawberries all throughout this region. And right here in the center, we see Cal Poly and we see the Strawberry Center, um, right in the center of, of this gr ideal growing region. 
The cultivars that we grow in California are varied. Um, the majority of them have been developed by university breeding programs, primarily University of California, a good portion also by private breeding programs that individual shipping companies um, actually support. Um, and if you compare um, California strawberries, you know, a crop value of almost three billion and produced on 40,000 acres, let's just compare that to a couple other industries in California. In cattle, cattle is three billion um, as an agricultural industry in California and uses over two million acres of land. The almond industry is a five billion dollar industry on 1.2 million dollars, excuse me, 1.2 million acres. So strawberries are a highly efficient crop. Um, we are actually grown on less than 1% of the state's farmland. And we're producing three billion in value. And I'll also throw in there that we create around 70,000 um, farm level jobs on an annual basis. So this shows our acreage and how it's changed over the years. Um, in response to demand, numbers of things have changed. Um, acreage has increased. We're now um, at one of our highest levels of acreage historically. Um, and that increase um, and the changes in cultivars that produce more yield, this is all in response to demand from the marketplace. So in order to supply that year-round demand, there's another dynamic that's been happening in our acreage. And that has been an increase in summer planted acres. So what are summer planted acres? These are, this is acreage that is planted during the summer months um, that is gonna come into production and produce a new crop in the fall months, in the late summer and as we go into the fall months and throughout the fall. Most of our summer planted acreage, or all of it in fact, is in the Santa Maria and Oxnard districts. And we have seen this shift to be able to supply that year round demand and this significant increase in summer planted acres over the years so that now represents about 25% of the total acreage planted in California. Busy chart, busy chart, I know. Um, but this is also illustrating kind of the why and how this has shifted in terms of the supply, how it's changed the supply. So this dashed line is 2012, California strawberry supply um, or, yeah, this is total strawberry supply in 2012. This is total strawberry supply in 2022. These orange lines dash to represent 2012 and solid to represent 2022 really illustrate this period where California is the single largest supplier um, of strawberries in the U.S. And the impact of that acreage shift um, and higher production in the fall has really shifted this window to the right. Um, so that has happened and in addition this early window has been more filled by imports from Mexico and a slight increase in production out of Florida. Does that make sense? Questions? So in the marketplace, um, most, of, most of our California production goes into retail. Um, I would say about 75 to 80% of our fresh production goes into the retail channel. So by far the largest channel for our strawberries and the most important. Um, so relationships with retailers with major supermarket chains is, is very important. And this chart's gonna show you just kind of the trends, the pricing trends over the years in terms of retail price per pound, so that's what you pay if you walk into the store per pound of strawberries, um, in comparison to FOB price for strawberries. Um, so FOB means free on board, um, and that's the cost of the berries, excluding the cost of transportation, let's say. And it can be considered an approximation of the average price received by farmers. And we have seen increased consumer demand over the years, we've seen this FOB price remain fairly flat. And so this increase in consumer demand actually helped drive more value back to the farms in recent years. Um, but that has leveled off. Um, and you can see how this has leveled off in comparison to retail prices 
which are still going up and on an upward trend because of inflation in the marketplace is primary. At the time that this pricing is remaining fairly flat, not changing much over 12 years, the cost to grow strawberries in California has become astronomical, has gone through the roof. And this next slide is really just to show you the impact of that cost. Um, I'm not going to go through this in a lot of um, detail, um, but over the years, um, the industry um, and farmers have had to consolidate. Um, there's been market consolidation in the supermarket world also. Um, that has created market pressure. Um, cost of production, I mentioned. Um, there's a long-term impact on the ability of farmers to continue to stay in business in the state. And so part of this impact is that the average farm size is getting larger. Um, we've been increasing acreage. Um, and our productivity also, if we look at trays per grower, has also started to level off in the last couple of years. So what we're going to see is more consolidation in our industry among farms and farming operations, and also probably shipping and marketing um, operations, because we need economies of scales in order to remain competitive and keep producing. I'm going to shift there. Well, I'll stop at there and see if there's any questions at this point, because I talked a whole lot about the U.S. and the pressures on farmers. So any questions? Yeah. Is one of the main reasons for the higher input costs for growers, is that just land, mostly land costs, or um, other things too? Um, it is the land costs, but more importantly, it is other, other factors, such as cost of labor um, has been increasing. Um, regulatory costs, California regulatory costs, um, the cost to use pesticides, the loss of crop protection tools um, over the years and having to shift to less effective crop protection tools. Um, two factors in labor um, are the increasing minimum wage and then also the um, ag overtime rules changing. All of these are driving costs up. Thanks. Okay, we're going to go to Mexico. Um, again, here's back to that chart uh, where we're looking at production, imports, exports, and consumption. This is a different picture if we look at this five-year trend. Um, we see the local production, we see total consumption, um, and we see exports on the rise, um, imports fairly flat. Um, the dynamic that has been happening in Mexico, um, you know, since before you know, 2018, probably over the last 10 to 15 years, is due to those rising production costs in California. Many California strawberry companies have been investing in Mexico and expanding early season production in Mexico um, as a lower cost alternative to, say, growing in Ventura County, um, because the timing, the seasonal timing of those areas is about the same time. Um, so the increased investment in Mexico has led to, you know, increase in production increase in production of strawberries that are specifically being grown to be exported into the U.S. And we see this dynamic. Um, and at the same time, you know, their total consumption within Mexico has been pretty strong. Um, and again, Mexico has been a good market for us as California as well. But that's part of the dynamic with Mexico um, and the growth in Mexico. Oh, question. Um, those, are, those are valid concerns. Um, in general, from our consumer surveys, we, we find that U.S. consumers are less or, let's say, more suspicious of imported berries. They would prefer to buy U.S. grown berries. Um, in terms of the risk, um, part of the reason for investing in Mexico is to mitigate some of that financial risk between California production cost, Mexico production cost, and also Florida. We are going to be seeing an increase in producing acres in Florida as well because it's less costly to produce there. Um, the quality um, can sometimes be a challenge and weather can be a challenge um, in central Mexico, which is uh, the main producing area of strawberries for export. Um, other area in Mexico is Baja California, which has you know, weather similar to Southern California. 
Um, but um, for most part, the quality is good, um, but they can have di more disruptions due to weather because the climate is not as ideal as what we have here in California. So I hope that's a long answer. I hope that answered your question. And, you know, Mexico is an important mar market for us as well. Um, there is demand um, for the high quality of California strawberries in Mexico. Um, they are seen as a premium product um, compared to local production, especially during the summer months. So when you see these export numbers and these trends, um, the majority of this fruit is entering Mexico between, you know, late April and early September. Um, during our peak season, um, when local production is lower, um, when the weather's warmer in Mexico, so it's harder to grow strawberries in certain areas. And the other shifts we're seeing in Mexico are consumer incomes are rising and more and more shoppers are starting to purchase fresh fruit and strawberries in supermarkets, um, those types of outlets, um, and Walmart and other pl types of places rather than the traditional local fruit markets. Um, all of this is kind of leading to up and down, but definitely some positive trends in terms of our ability to export and supply Mexico. Um, just shifting to Canada. Again, Canada, our largest trading partner, um, our most important partner here in the U.S. Um, these are there, these are the kind of the same trends for Canada. Um, you can see consumption trends over the years. Um, they cannot produce, you know, enough. Their production is quite low in Canada, um, and so they are required to import to meet their needs. Um, you know, local production levels have stabled in the last five years. Um, so they are pretty stable right now, um, but in 2022, local production in Canada was uh, below that in 2017. Um, so it's becoming more difficult to produce in Canada. They have a very short growing season. Some of the things that are going on in Canada to help mitigate that is an increase in um, indoor growing facilities, uh, greenhouse production facilities. Very small um, but growing segment um, and also a segment that is supplying local demand um, and, and also some imports into the U.S., primarily into the eastern and midwestern parts of the country. And this just gives a picture of, you know, the, the imports into Canada, Canada, who's supplying Canada. Pretty much everything coming into Canada is either coming from the U.S. or Mexico. Um, Mexico's share has increased over the last five years. And this bar chart is added just to, just, just to show you some of the trends on the up and down, but to illustrate how important this market is um, in terms of moving volume out of the U.S. marketplace um, and into another marketplace where our California strawberries are very competitive up in Canada. Um, one of the reasons there's such strong demand is because California strawberries are lower priced than domestically produced fruit in Canada. Okay. So I'm going to talk about some market and consumption trends. Um, any questions, any additional questions up to this point? Okay. Um, so back to here, uh, looking at the same chart, but thinking about it in terms of supply. Um, this seasonality, again, is, is really important. This is the market window that all of us in California, this is what we're focused on. Um, when we are the dominant supplier um, here in, the, in North America, and that's what we focus on in order to, to move our crop and help hope that our farms are productive um, and profitable during this time frame. So the importance of strawberries in the market. So think about the supermarket and the produce department. Strawberries are one of the most important products that you can buy that are sold in the supermarket, and that makes them very important to retailers. Um, if we look at the berry category as a whole, um, on an annual basis, it's about nine million, excuse me, nine billion in revenue to the supermarket. Um, the berry category includes strawberries, blackberries, um, raspberries, blueberries. That's what we consider the berry category. And when you walk in the store, you usually see the berry category, all merchandised together. Um, strawberries are a very important part of that. Um, almost four billion in sales and the 
second most important fruit in terms of sales revenue in the produce department. And this has been a really a dramatic change, and I'll go all the way 20 years ago when I started at the California Strawberry Commission. Strawberries were the fifth most <laughs> important fruit in the produce department in terms of sales revenue. Um, they were after apples, bananas, grapes, and oranges, and strawberries were number five. So we have come a long way um, as marketers at a as a whole um, and giving people more reasons to buy strawberries. We've made the supply better. Um, we've made the quality better and more consistent. And this is some of the results. And so we are now a category at retail that the retailers can't ignore um, anymore, right? So very, very important. Um, and this is just, this will illustrate to you what's happened in that very category and just within the last five years. Um, and this is volume, this is volume. And so all of the berries um, are increasing their importance um, in the fresh produce aisle. And the strawberries um, are maintaining their own, um, even as blueberries gain share because of increased blueberry production um, in North and South America. That's, that is what primarily supplies the U.S. with blueberries. Um, still doing pretty well maintaining our share um, and serving as the anchor um, of that category and the most, the most affordable fruit and berry in that category um, and most consistently available year round. So this slide shows um, you know, some of the strawberry supply trends. Um, so this is fresh strawberry supply. Um, so in 2018, here in California, we produced a record, I think 224 million trays of strawberries. Um, and that was 77.5% of US supply. Um, and the, the remaining um, was accounted for um, Florida about 10%, Mexico about 12%, and that's what we kind of see illustrated on this chart. There, um, we move forward to 2022, and now we see that Mexico's share of market um, has increased um, to over 15%, almost 16% of the fresh market share. Um, California's share has, sh has reduced, um, and Florida has made pretty much pretty much consistent over the years. Um, so we do expect um, Mexico to continue um, increasing share of U.S. strawberry supply, um, and that's due to the increase in cost um, for U.S. production. We expect Mexico's share to continue to increase. And second slide I'll show you, second chart I'll show you on the slide ties it all back to retail and the retail category sales in the U.S. And this is, this is, if you look at the pounds, how they're made up. Um, and this sliver, sliver here is what California strawberries represents of all of those pounds. Um, total berry category pounds. Um, and this is other strawberries. So think of strawberries from Florida and strawberries from Mexico. And so we really are here in California, the foundation for the entire North American berry crop and for all berry sales in the U.S. In terms of consumption, um, so we, US, um, U.S. consumes the most strawberries, you know, per capita, um, and then Canada and U.S. are pretty much similar. Um, Mexico has a slightly lower per capita consumption, and this is fresh only, so it's a contrast to some of the data I showed earlier, a little bit different, shows a different trend. Um, but the point to make about Mexico is it's consuming much higher level of fruit consumed per capita in Mexico than in Canada and the U.S. So what all this data, all these factors, so what are the other things we look, about, we look at? I mean, these are the trends, but what are the other things we look at or we look into as marketers to understand how do we, how do we take advantage of you know, the demand that exists in Canada and Mexico for our strawberries, and in the U.S. for that matter. Um, and how do we continue to grow that demand? Uh, we do surveys. Um, so we, we ask consumers, you know, what, what are you looking for when you purchase strawberries? Um, you ask them many, many questions. And so these are just their purchase factors. Um, in Canada, most interestingly, over the last three years, um, purchase factors have, have shifted. 
um, high in vitamin C and low in sugar are now two of the top purchase factors in Canada. And that's followed by price, fresh appearance, um, and the availability of organic, of organic. So price and appearance throughout all the years and doing all these surveys, they are always up there in the top five factors. Um, but most recently, we started to see a shift where nutrients or health factors are starting to play a role in what people are looking for when they purchase strawberries in the store. Now in Mexico, it's a different story. Um, in Mexico, um, fresh appearance and price are still really, really important to those shoppers. Um, the size of the strawberry, the flavor, the color. So more of the aesthetic appeal to the strawberry um, in Mexico. But that health halo is, is still there also for strawberries, and that has also increased over the years. Um, we have been for many years promoting the health benefits of strawberries and doing research that supports those health benefits and promoting to consumers um, and to registered dietitian nutritionists. And so we ask questions about what do you think about strawberries? Are they, are they healthy? Are they healthier than other fruits? Um, or you, you know, are they one of the healthiest fruits? And what we're starting to see is this shift where more and more consumers, almost 50% now in Canada in our most recent survey, are saying that they think of strawberries as one of the healthiest fruits they can eat. In Mexico, strawberries have enjoyed that health halo for a longer period of time, um, where you can see a greater percentage of consumers agree with that statement. Um, and again, still going in the right direction from our perspective. Um, the higher the health perception um, for berries, I think the, you know, the, more, the more we have the opportunity to promote it and re-educate consumers and um, keep that message front and center. Question? Um, how do you go about distributing the surveys to consumers? Like, who gets them and how do you go about doing that? That's a good question. Uh, we work with research companies. There are companies that specialize in doing consumer research. Um, these surveys are typically fielded online. Um, they're usually about a thousand consumers, um, considered nationally, geographically, demographically representative of the population of whatever area or country that you're serving. Other questions? Okay. Okay, so now we'll shift just away from strawberries because I know the, you probably have more questions about marketing and other things, but I wanna talk about some of the broader information that we look at as marketers when we're trying to figure out how, do we, how are we gonna connect with consumers and what do consumers really care about their food and when they're talking about food and beverage purchasing and choices. Um, so I'm gonna go through a few insights from the International Food Information Council's annual survey. Um, this is a survey um, annually over a th of over a thousand U.S. adults. Um, and in most recent, here in 2022, they did an oversample of Gen Z. Um, so Gen Z is age 18 to 24. Show of hands, how many people here um, are Gen Zers? Okay, good amount, good amount. That's great. Um, so we can have our own focus group here. We can look at some of these trends that, they've, that IFIC has been identifying, monitoring, and we can see what your reactions are to them um, or what you think, okay? So one of, the, one of the things that is increased in importance, and I don't think this is news to anyone, um, but the importance of environmental sustainability in our food choices um, has increased in 2022. Um, we expect it's gonna continue to increase. Um, this chart shows, you know, I think, um, we're up to what, almost 40% of consumers now, now saying that environmental sustainability is important. Um, these other factors haven't really changed much over the years, um, but sustainability is becoming more important. So this next slide. So over half of consumers now, 52%, um, believe their food choices have an impact on the environment, okay? So I'd like to ask, just show of hands, how many of you believe your food and beverage choices have a significant or moderate impact on the environment? Put them up high, come on. 
One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, we have about half, maybe a little more than half. So how do we line up here? When you break it out by age group, um, you know, younger population, so you guys are right there. You're right in line with the, the Gen Z group. Uh, it's 50% of Gen Zers. It's probably small to see on that slide. Yeah. So 52% of consumers overall. So all of us. And that's a big bump, at least overall, from last year. It's up about 10 percentage points. Anytime you see a shift of about 10 percentage points in a survey like this, that means, that means the impact is significant. It's something um, to be aware of and be thinking about whether you want to influence it one way or another, it's something that's going to have to drive your marketing programs and how you're communicating with consumers. Okay, another topic um, of interest is getting in a lot of conversation in social media, online, in the news is, is food waste. So now, you know, nearly six in 10 consumers are concerned about food waste. Um, we know that younger consumers um, care even more Right? Um, and so there's different reasons why people are concerned about food waste. Um, so if you were to say, what is, what is for you the top reason that you might be concerned about food waste? Volunteers? One of the, which one of these factors do you think is, is most important or most influences you when you think about food waste? Can you read the factors? Yep. Um, one, it's a waste of money. Okay, we got some folks agree with that. Uh, two, uh, people in, there are people in need of food. Okay. Great, that's more, that's almost everybody. Um, you were taught not to waste food. Okay. Um, the impact on the environment. Okay. Um, and the issue of letting healthy, fresh foods go uneaten. Important, so fewer. And so the survey says, you might have figured that they were ordered in the, top, in the, in the order of the top reasons, uh, but the top three reasons is about the waste of money, people in need, and that we are taught not to waste, not to waste food. And so, this is last data slide, I promise, and I'm not gonna you know, go over this you know, too much, but I just wanna talk about when we're thinking about food waste and how do we connect with consumers and help them with the issue of food waste. There are ways that we do that, and so we look at this sort of research. And so what we're trying to do is give consumers easier ways to plan their meals before shopping. That's one of these, um, that's one of these factors, one of these tactics that consumers are trying to figure out how to do, how do we, how do we plan my, our meals better? So we create recipes on our website where you can download that recipe and you can also create a shopping list from that recipe if you want to make that recipe. A lot of marketers are doing that now. Turning your recipes into shopping lists, that helps people plan their food purchases. Um, the other thing, um, educating people on how to store. So one thing is store items better to reduce spoilage. Um, that's an important factor. Um, we regularly provide tips on storage and handling for the consumer um, for strawberries. Um, how many people here um, think that you should wash all of your strawberries when you get them home from the store? Oh, there are a few. Okay. Okay. How many think you should wait and wash, all your, wash your strawberries right before you eat them? All right. Good. Um, so you guys have the right answer. Uh, your strawberries will last longest um, if you keep them in the, in the refrigerator, in the package you purchased them in, um, and just wash them right before you're ready to eat them. So that's an example of a handling tip that we give to people that not everybody knows, right? Um, and then how do I preserve food? I think there was one in here about preserving food. Um, that's another way, right? We also provide tips on our website, videos. Here's how you store, here's how you freeze strawberries. You bought too many strawberries, you're worried they're gonna go bad. Um, you can easily freeze them at home. So 
So I'm going to get to the summary points. Um, just overall, there's a lot of dynamics in the North American market, but that demand is still rising, and that always provides opportunities. Um, and so despite those rising costs, California companies are adapting to these market changes um, and are meeting the needs of consumers and customers. Um, and they're doing it in a number of strategies, and I've talked about some of those things here today. And health perceptions and quality are still very important, even here as we sit several years um, after the major impact of the pandemic. Um, and they still lead um, as purchase factors over price, and that's despite all the inflation that we've been experiencing. And then sustainability topics are increasingly prominent in shaping our food choices and will be um, over the next few years. So with that, I thank you for your time and your attention. And if there's any other questions or any other topics around marketing strawberries you'd like to discuss, I am here. I need to sit for a second. Yes, please. <laughs> I have a boot on my ankle. Uh, what questions do you have for, uh, for Chris Christian today? Let's go ahead. I was curious where you saw the pandemic affecting the house. Like, I assume production was a big factor, but did you see anything in consumption that was like, actually serious? Um, so the, yeah, the question is uh, where did we see the pandemic impacting the market? the most. Um, okay, um, so we saw um, some initial market disruption um, right at that beginning of the shutdown um, where strawberries were on the road, berries were on the road, and supermarkets were like, we have to close, we can't take them. Um, so we had an immediate market disruption for, let's say, about 14 days. Um, but then after that, um, people, you know, the marketplace figured out how are they going to adjust, how are they going to serve, you know, customers. Um, and we experienced a return sort of to normal shipment levels and then also a surge in demand, incredible surge in demand. And we attribute some of that, some of that to the immunity benefits of strawberries, the vitamin C content. Consumers were really looking for vitamin C containing fruits that were convenient. So minimal market disruption um, and then a really big increase in market demand. Was any of it based on more people being at home and buying, just shopping more and cooking more at home? Was that a factor, do you think? I think so. Um, not our surveys, but IFIX survey indicated that. So there was a shift in, in habits where you couldn't go out to eat. Um, you were buying more food at the supermarket and you were cooking more at home. There was a surge in interest in um, recipes and online recipe videos in social media as well. Um, we shifted some of our marketing tactics at the time um, from in-person sort of things to online things. We, we worked with our influencer partners to do more recipe videos, quick simple recipe videos. We put together some videos with registered dietitians talking about the immunity and health benefits of strawberries and here's easy ways to use them and here's how you can freeze them if you can only go to the store once a week because of the you know the store hours here's how you can preserve the strawberries so we did a lot of that other questions so it seems like you do focus a lot on educating consumers about product like vitamin C That's a good question. Uh, the question is about, you know, our consumer outreach programs have been about vitamin C, the benefits of strawberries, how to use them over the years, and do we also educate um, about the farmers and how they're grown? And the answer to that is a resounding yes. We have over the past five years shifted a lot to capturing the stories of our farmers um, and farm workers. And the point is that people are so disconnected from where their food comes from, we want them to understand strawberries are grown by real people. In California, they're grown here by real people in the best place in the world to grow strawberries, and they provide opportunity. Um, for everyone who works in this industry, there's an opportunity to a better life um, working in strawberries, and we're capturing those stories and promoting those on social media as well. Has anybody seen some of those stories? Anybody seen any of our videos? CaliforniaStrawberries.com? Oh, I didn't put the website up there. 
<laughs> but CaliforniaStrawberries.com, you can find lots of stories about our farmers, our farm workers, or follow us on Instagram. Some people might not be, I'm oh, sorry, I'm not going to ask a question oh. if you've got questions. Jesus, and then, yeah. yeah, my question is, uh, yeah. does uh, Florida or Mexico have something similar as the uh, Strawberry Commission, or, or is it basically monitored by the California Strawberry Commission? Um, that's also a good question. So the question was, uh, does Florida and Mexico have um, you know, organizations like the California Strawberry Commission? In Florida, there's the Florida Gro Strawberry Growers Association. That is a voluntary organization. Um, and they, um, they support the industry. They do some marketing. Um, they, they support the University of Florida research programs. Um, they have an industry fund through which they, they support the research programs there. Somewhat similar to what the Strawberry Commission does here. In Mexico, there's an organization called Anna Berries um, that works for all uh, berry producers who are exporting, company, berry companies who are exporting stra strawberries and other berries to the U.S. Um, and they are more of a trade association. Um, and they do different programs to help their members, mostly with regulatory compliance um, and trade issues. Yeah, my question was regarding exports. Mm -hmm. So do you see exports increasing? And if so, um, are increase in increasing in comparison? And then how would that affect um, our labor, since we are getting like, H2O workers coming in? Okay, that's and a good that, question. Yeah. <laughs> that's a complicated question, Miriam. <laughs> Um, I, I do see kind of a general upward trend um, on exports, but it's not going to be a huge increase year over year. And um, it is impacted by our ability to get labor. Um, you might know better than me what percentage of our labor force right now is H-2A guest workers. Is it 20% now? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, labor is a challenge. Um, you know, availability of labor here in, in California. And so that's just, just one challenge, but there, there is still that opportunity in export markets. And I, I really believe that the, the biggest opportunities are here in North, North America, um, where populations are still growing um, and uh, where it's easier to transport, it's lower cost to transport mm -hmm. our strawberries and we can get them there higher quality. Yep. Um, the product interest slides when you showed that Canada had organic production be pretty equally interested mm -hmm. over a couple of years. Um, is that mostly the same in the U.S. and Mexico too, where there's kind of a constant um, interest? You mean the consumer interest in organic production? Yeah. yeah. Canada is a little different as a purchase factor. Um, organic is a, is a top purchase factor in Canada in the top five, not so much in Mexico. Um, organic um, is, is way down on the purchase tree. You think of all those bar chart, those bars on that chart, you know, if, if there were 12 instead of five in Mexico, it's far, much farther down. Um, in the U.S., it's probably less of a factor, but an increasing factor as well in terms of purchase intent. You mentioned uh, the Florida Strawberry Growers Association yeah. and then the California Strawberry Commission. Commission. And then I've heard other things like the California Almond Board. Okay. There's all these different, can you speak a little bit about what the difference is between those groups? Uh, yes. So in the case of Florida, when something's an association, it is usually a voluntary organization. Um, so there is a Pistachio Exporters Association in California instead of a pistachio commission. Um, so when it's an association or a council, sometimes uh, they, are, they are voluntary or more trade type associations. In the case of a commission um, specific to California, um, in California Food and Agriculture Code, um, the commissions that exist today were all created by state law. So there is a, actually a California Strawberry Commission law. There's a California Table Grape Commission law. Um, there's a California Walnut Commission law, um, and we are mandatory programs um, funded by the industry. The Almond Board um, is both a California, they have two marketing orders. They have a California um, marketing order that's overseen by the Department of Agriculture, similar to our program, and then they also have a federal marketing order. Walnuts does also. And so the federal marketing orders um, 
and the U.S. Highbush Blueberry Council is an example is another example of a federal marketing order. The Haas Avocado Board is an example of a federal marketing order. They receive assessments from both domestic production um, and imported production. So anything that is sold in the United within the United States is funding those boards, and they are overseen by USDA. So there's some intricacies there. <laughs> it takes a little bit of understanding and knowledge about it's all these different commodities and how they're organized, how they, they're all, the purpose of any of these though is to join forces to do something more than they can do by themselves. Right. We as are doing this. Individual farmers have yeah. very little power. <coughs> if, they, if they get together as an organization, their their voice can be heard more readily, right? And right. So in some cases, there's funding involved. In other cases, it's a loose associ association. In some cases, it's marketing oriented. In the case of the California Strawberry Commission, you have research. You we have, have marketing. Re research, have marketing. We have policy work. Um, you know, we have issues management. Um, crisis management type work. We have, you know, sort of a very diverse set of programs that we do in support of our industry, um, and that's in comparison to some of the other boards, which might be primarily marketing a little bit of research or primarily marketing a little bit of industry relations and no research. Um, when the Strawberry Commission was created, it was for that very purpose that Gerald mentioned, is that farmers um, needed to put their resources together um, into have the research done that was important to moving the moving the industry and the farming forward but then also be able to impact the marketplace so the strawberry commission was created as a research and promotion order initially one other thing that uh, I, I have, people ask me this frequently and i wonder how you would answer it chris <laughs> uh, apples are marketed by variety you go in there there's granny smith and there's red delicious and there's uh, honey crisp and you go buy a clamshell of strawberries and we know that there are lots of different varieties of strawberries but you never know what variety you're buying why is that right. uh, because our varieties and strawberry varieties don't stick around forever um, and we grow I'm not sure how many varieties we grow in the state do you know that Probably question 15 or 20, 15 or 20 at least and uh, they're all developed for different parts of the state, different regions, um, different times of the year. And uh, as I said, they, the, the, the plant quality or the strength of the plant or the genetics, um, it doesn't continue to produce at the same quality level and productivity level year over year over year over year. And so that is the reason why we have to have this continual pipeline of new varieties coming in um, to, to maintain and increase um, our competitiveness and that of our farmers. Um, but it also means that you can't really market something by variety like a Granny Smith apple um, because it might, it's going to be gone probably in 10 or 15 years. It's no longer going to be in production. Since you, and since you know so much about consumer preferences in strawberries, what would be the perfect strawberry? How would you describe it? What would be its color, its size, its flavor? Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Do you have the ideal strawberry? Oh, I, I, can, I can speak from what you know, consumers tell us, which would be the ideal strawberry is, is kind of this nice, you know, medium to large sized, beautiful, fully red fruit, shiny, red on the inside, um, not too hard because people sometimes say strawberries are too hard when they respond to surveys, um, and a strawberry that would last about four days longer um, than they currently last when people bring them home from the store. Any other questions? Uh, what is the role of the commission in the event of a recall? Oh, that's a great question. So that goes to um, the role of the commission in the event of a recall. Um, we, um, we do some crisis communications. Um, depending on the scope of the issue, we are going to be communicating with FDA and or state regulators to try to understand what is happening. Uh, we're going to be working to gather information and get that information out to our industry members to alert them um, before a public announcement is made by FDA. 
because of our relationships with FDA and other regulatory agencies, we often hear about an announced recall. I'll use the recent hepatitis A recall of frozen strawberries. We often hear something in, in advance. Um, sometimes it's not much, um, but we'll get a heads up from our congressional representative's office, or we'll get a heads up from people we know at FDA themselves, um, or if there's a company involved in our industry, um, probably about 50% of the time that company is going to let us know um, ahead of time. And we try to get a notice out to our industry members as soon as possible, just putting them on alert. Um, the re recalls can have a devastating impact um, on the rest of the industry, um, and a recall, you know, that's, you know, falsely accusing strawberries or inaccurately describing, inaccurately described, I'll go back to last year's fresh strawberry recall, um, you know, from Mex of strawberries from Mexico, um, that, can, that can cost millions of dollars in market impact, um, depending upon the timing. And in two weeks, that is the topic uh, that our speaker will address. Dave Murray is coming to talk about crisis Great. management. Great, yeah, Dave. So he's lived through a few of these He's things. lived through a few, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so. so that'll be a great topic for yeah. you guys. I'm really anxious to hear what he has to say. We yep. have not had that topic yet, so I'm really anxious to hear. Yep. Yeah, our, our role is really to inform, um, to, to handle media um, if needed, um, and to, if necessary, advocate on behalf of our industry members with the regulators. Right. Any other questions? Yes. Um, with the strawberry fusion being state law created and sort of like not volunteer led, who chooses who gets to be in the commission or like what's the hiring process like and who is like more of like the overseeing power? Oh, so the over we the overseeing power of the commission is the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Uh, because we are mandatory, um, you know, we were created because the industry voted to create the commission. They wanted the commission. So every five years, um, the Department of Food and Agriculture is going to hold a hearing um, and ask people to come in and express their opinion um, of whether or not the Strawberry Commission should continue, should continue to, to work. And depending what people say, industry members say at, at that hearing or submit written you know, testimony, um, CDFA will decide if we need to have a referendum, which would be a vote of any all companies that produce or market strawberries in the state. Um, so that is how we're kind of overseen, and that's how CDFA makes sure that we're still relevant to the industry that's funding us and that we're supporting. Was your question more, were you asking about staffing? Yeah, you were asking about staffing, so yeah, part two, staffing of the... At yeah, the commission? I mean, we had growers come in and talk to like, I was being to Michael Strawberry, it's really like the students. And I know there were like a lot of growers involved and a lot of different people who had different jobs, so that's why I was kind of wondering about the staffing and like who gets to be on the like, commission. Oh, yeah, so, so the commission itself is, uh, we have our staff, right? And so Miriam is a member of our staff. Um, and we have our staff, and we, 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 are, we hire staff, we have pretty small staff. Um, we only have about, I think we have 30 employees now, um, but um, the companies who make up our board um, are, are really the ones who are looking for new talent coming into the industry in all sorts of aspects, business, accounting, um, HR, um, finance, agri you know, agriculture farming operations, marketing, um, you know, consumer communications. There's a wide range of jobs that you can find in our industry. Um, we have all of those sorts of functions within the commission. We have, you know, we have research, we have uh, grower education and outreach, we have marketing and communications, um, we have very small accounting staff. Um, we don't even have an HR person, we're that small. Um, so, but there's all these opportunities um, within the industry for those types of positions. Does that, does that help? Who has the power to make change if, you know, who are you reporting to as a commission? And do the, does that group of people have the power to make change if they're unhappy with what's going on? You talked about a referendum. Yeah. Short of a referendum, is there, could, could, is there another person or a group of people who yes. could say, we really don't like what's going on here? Yeah, so who oversees our day-to-day -day and our programs and how we spend our money and what, how we are staffed and what we're working on, that's our board of directors. 
Um, our board of directors is made up of, it's about, let's see, 38 people, I think now. And it's made up of growers, shippers, and processors. Majority of the seats on our board are held by growers. Over 60% of the seats are grower seats. Um, so they decide what programs we work on, how we are staffed to execute those programs, um, and what our strategic plan is you know, for the next five years. And they regularly update our priorities. And they work as a collective board. And then also, they form committees that oversee the different parts of our program. Yes. Oh, average size would probably be um, now. Um, average farm size is over 100 acres, I think now. But there is a range. So there's a range from uh, independent, um, independently owned farming operations that are maybe 50 to 100 acres. Um, there are employees of larger farming companies who are on our board. Um, so it, it is a mix. So we have represented small independent companies. We have the larger companies represented both on the farming side um, and also on the, the marketing side, the shipper side. Um, It's, it's really those trends, Shashika, are really driven by the market demand and where the, the retail customers are saying, we want to promote strawberries you know, more consistently or we need a greater supply of strawberries going into the fall months. And so that is really what, what drives that. Um, and that's, you know, in the fall, we, in, in having that new crop and new, you know, new strawberries coming from the southern and um, Santa Maria growing districts is really important to kind of maintain what the consumers are looking for throughout the year. Mm -hmm. One last thing. You said you were looking to hire an individual at the commission. I think it yes. might be interesting for the students to hear the kind of person you were looking for and why. Um, yes, yeah, so we're looking, uh, we're going to be very shortly posting a position for a business analyst um, at the commission. Um, the business analyst will report to our um, data, data information manager. And uh, we'll be focused on a lot of the things like some of the data you see that I shared with you, um, doing analyses of our production data, um, working on our, our reporting tools, our forecasting. Um, capabilities, um, just our general information system, our regular reports that are available on our website. Um, we are looking for someone, you know, kind of with a math or statistics degree um, with an interest in agriculture. It could be an agriculture um, major um, or someone with a minor in agriculture, um, but we're really looking for someone who is heavily into analytics um, and has some experience in analytics um, and that affinity for numbers. Just thought, even if nobody here is interested, I thought you might be interested to know the diversity of employment opportunities that are out yep. there in agriculture, right? You can be a statistician and end up crunching numbers and tracking trends in agriculture. Yeah. So, yeah. All yeah. right. Um, any final questions? All right. Uh, Chris, thank you very much. For thank you, guys. Appreciate it.